right, so I am welcoming this week's episode of the Interim Whisper to our show is John Shulman. We're going to meet him in a minute, but this week's Interim Whisper tip of the week is to remember to acknowledge your interns when they finish their internship. You want to make sure that you take them out to either lunch, do something like that, give them some social love. Remember, they came in here and they worked hard with you. They put up with maybe a grumpy personality, like, I don't know, today. And that's what Axel had to do with me. (laughs) Nonetheless, you want to be kind to your intern. And remember, it's always paying that step forward. Okay, so our show, like I said, is all about the future of work. And our guest today is John Shulman with Aligner. Welcome to the Intern Whisper, John. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, Axel. Really nice to be with you today. Super cool. So we met at the Serious Play Conference. A little shout out to Sue Bole with the Serious Play Conference. And I was so impressed with your product. And you had the most engagement out of the whole conference. And I was managing two and a half tracks. So I saw a lot of engagement, but yours won the show. And I just wanted to say, oh, I've got to know this person even better and bring him onto the show so we can share your product with the world. And our show is heard globally, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was really super fun working with you at the conference. And I agree. We had a great group. And that's that's really what makes it fun when people are engaged and sharing, which they really did. Hmm. I agree. I'm going to go ahead and let Axel kick us off. So Axel, you even get to read that first part of the show that intros. Our show is all about education, innovation, business, and the future of industries and jobs. Now let's talk about these questions. So our first question is, can you share with our viewers with your educational background and work history? Yeah, I have kind of a strange educational background. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I went to public school. But then I, in 10th grade, I had an opportunity to go for an exchange year to India. And this was a long time ago before folks were moving around the world quite as much as we do today. So I spent a year at a boarding school in the Himalayas. It was amazing. It changed my life. It was an incredible experience. Then I came back, finished up high school in Minneapolis, and ended up going to Harvard College in Boston, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Studied English literature when I was there, and then took another year off in India again and taught at a boarding school in India, a different school from the one I had gone to, and then returned to Harvard for three more years of law. So I got a a JD, a law degree from Harvard Law School in 1990, quite a ways, quite a while ago. That's my formal education, but I think, you know, I've I've been informally educated through travel, through dealing with people, and I feel like I'm. I'm still learning every day. But. Oh my gosh. Take that word still out. You are learning every day. In For this sure. instance, I go still. It sounds like a diminishing word, kind of like the word just. And I go, oh no, take it out. We are those things. Yes, we are learning every day. Totally. Yeah. I will tell you, I went to Boston in 2019 and I had never been there. I spent a whole day and a half at Harvard. Now I was there for three days and I decided I want to spend one and a half days at Harvard. I did go to MIT, BU. I saw all of these amazing schools, but Harvard has been the school that was like the dream school that I went, oh, I want to go there. I graduated from Rollins College here in Orlando. And when I took the tour at Harvard, I realized Rollins is a liberal arts school, but it had actually modeled itself after Harvard. And I went, well, there you go. I guess I went to a little mini version of it. Maybe not a little, it was a mini version of it. Even down to the dining hall, it felt like I was walking into Harry Potter. Such a cool dining hall. It had, Axel, it had giant big chairs, you know, like in the Harry Potter uh, dining hall. And it was really, it was very, very good food. Isabella, I'm guessing you did not look up at the ceiling. I'm hoping you did not, because I don't know if they still do the same thing we did back in the day, but people used to take those butter pats that you'd get, you know, in the dining hall. They'd put them on spoons and flip them up off the ceiling. So they'd see if they could get them to stick on the ceiling. And it was- The ceilings were so high. Yeah, it was, it was quite a feat to be able to do it, but I, I was always wondering when are they going to drop and how's that going to work? Oh so. my gosh, no, I didn't look at that. But- I spent time going to take a tour of Mm. campus, and that was incredible. It was 
really when it was cold, it was December. I was amazed that there's this giant underground tunnel that's big enough you can drive two golf carts through and still be able to walk through. It's extremely well lit. Underground, every, just so you know, Axel, underground, every single building, every dorm. And it was kind of like being in a game where you're like a miner or a mole underground. Mm-hmm. And, you up and you're like, oh, I'm inside. It was heated. It had art in it, so it was truly the feeling of passing through a bit of a museum, if you will. It had history also uh, built into some of the design, and it was amazing. So I did the tour of the campus. I met with the career services there about Intern Pursuits product, wanting to have them come in as a partner. Maybe you can help me with that. And then I also had visited the Entrepreneur Center there, and I just sat down and just read books while I was there. It was the best experience. Oh my gosh. I am so, I can't say envious. That's not the right word, but I sure do appreciate the fact that you got to go there and be surrounded by the richness of history, I think. Yeah, no, it's it's quite a place. The experience you have, I think, is largely driven by your own willingness to reach out, try new things, because one of the things that, especially in the undergrad, the college experience, because And this is the case really honestly at any college you go to, you come from high school where you have a certain, you know, set of friends or people who know you really well, obviously your parents or, you know, people, family, people around you, and they have a certain vision of you and an idea of who you are. And when you go to college, especially if you're lucky enough to be able to go away to college and be on campus, what happens is you, you have an opportunity, especially at that age to really begin to explore and in some ways redefine who you are in your own terms. And I think that's kind of the coolest thing. I actually had a friend, you know, she knew all about all these resources that I knew nothing about in college. So it turned out that almost every week or two, they would bring in these astonishing speakers and nobody would go. I mean, nobody in the sense that maybe 20, 30, 40 people might go out of this huge university. So I got to meet people like, and I'm talking like really close, even just talking to them, people like Sugar Ray Leonard, the boxing champion right after he, you know, right when he was still in, you know, at that time, still a a boxing great. I actually sat at the table for lunch with the head of the United Nations at the time, Javier Perez de Cuellar. And just the people you could, it was crazy. And, you you know, and all you had to do was sign up and you could go do it. So it was between that and then and Kwame Touré, who was known originally as Stokely Carmichael, a great civil rights activist. You know, a lot of people who you do, you never even think, wow, I could actually meet this person. And, and so a lot of it was that. And then second is the people you go to school with. I mean, a lot of really cool, interesting people that you can keep in touch with your whole life. So pretty neat. And I think it's typical in that way of any university, any college that you go to, where you really make that effort to try to reach out and and expand yourself. So that that was, for me, that was kind of the coolest thing. Hey, Axel went to University of Central Florida. There is a class that you take and you get to go hear speakers. It's a little bit like a TED Talk. Have you ever done, I can't think of what the class is called. Um, did you ever do that? I have no idea what you heard what talking about. about. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go look it up and make sure I know what I'm talking about for sure. There was an event that I wanted to go to. Because COVID happened, it got canceled. It was from Ben Shapiro. Hmm. Oh wow! Yeah, they they do see if those have events. Usually, it happens a lot in the first week. Because I know after that week, I'm gonna be like busy the rest of the semester. So I try to go to events the first week. Like he he was in town right when COVID hit. That's when they canceled. Axel, I'm going to be a really bad influence. You might want to adjust the percentage of studying, percentage of doing all these other things. It sounds crazy, but every this is the one thing I've seen with my own kids and just like how education has changed. Everybody's focused like all the time, work, 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 work. And I'm not saying you shouldn't work. Don't get me wrong. But I think there, there I always say there's got to be opportunities to carve out time for yourself, for your pursuits, for your hobbies. For yeah. Fun. Because otherwise what happens is it's like, yeah, you're done with college. You move on to the so-called real life. And it's like, shoot, you realize college was a great opportunity to explore all kinds of things. Uh, it's really important, I find that, you know. Yeah, to- like, I've always tried to do that. And it's crazy because a lot of the times I, I would try to do that. 
And then I couldn't because I would always have an exam on that day, oh, which no. is terrible. Like I, I've always wanted to go to a football game. Yeah. And I've never. <laughs> well, you got to do it. You got to do it. So. <laughs> nah, because yeah. I'm telling you the truth. Honestly, you'll never remember your grades, but you'll remember those experiences. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's graduated he, he, yeah uh, that you window so now you go back and you can be one of those alums who's like acting like yeah i love the football team and all that stuff and you didn't even i'll go probably go football. hopefully i'll definitely go to a football game i can't miss one that's good to hear so is there aside from going to harvard and that that is a really unique perspective that you could be exposed to that level of notoriety in the world and have access to real conversations is there anything else that you think was unique to Harvard that maybe other schools don't offer? I don't honestly believe that there is anything other than the Harvard name, the reputation or whatever, that's actually truly, you know, unique in the sense that other people don't have it. I do think, you know, probably they lead in some areas that, you know, to your point earlier, Isabella, a lot of other colleges and universities kind of replicate or, or follow or maybe even, you know, improve upon things that that often were started at Harvard. So one area actually that's been important in my career and my life is the whole concept of interest-based negotiation. It's obviously, it's a very old concept, but there were some professors at Harvard at the law school and business school, uh, one of whom I had an opportunity to spend time with in, at the law school, um, a fellow named Roger Fisher, wrote, they wrote a book called Getting to Yes. And this book became sort of foundational in the way many people in business, government, organizations think about negotiation these days. So I think you do get an opportunity to interact with thought leaders or people who are sort of at the forefront in, in certain areas. And, and that was one of the really cool things that I experienced there. I think we always like to think, oh yeah, it's, it's like so amazing. It's so far beyond you know, other things. And I mean, honestly, I've come across a lot of really amazing people, institutions and resources all over, all over the world. I agree. My my career is built around education. I know that was something that you and I had both talked about. Uh, you were a, previously a classroom teacher, and I went classroom teacher. I went to adjunct teacher, and then I'm all but dissertation for that PhD. But my goodness, I think that our our backgrounds are similar since you also studied English. I had an interest in law. I did not choose that, but I worked with a lot of attorneys and decided not to go that route, though. Well, I kind of did the same thing after I had gone that route. That was sort of a weird thing. When I, when I graduated from law school, I joined a mid-sized firm in a law firm in uh, Minneapolis where my family was based and my father is actually a lawyer there. And I started doing human rights law and also plaintiff antitrust law, which is like anti-monopoly law where you sue big companies in order to try to stop them from essentially squeezing out the little guy. I loved it at first because it was very challenging, but it was also really scary to me because I always worried about, and this is, I think, whenever you start a new career, a new adventure, and you're not really sure about all how to do all the things, all the rules, the sort of expectations. But what I found was it was super exciting, but it was also stressful. And so I was learning a lot. I enjoyed many aspects of it, but I also felt that there was something a little bit missing and it had to do with the lawyers themselves seemed really obsessively focused on minute details and things that really, in my view, kind of missed the bigger picture of justice, of you know how things should be done, how people should be treated, stuff like that. Then secondly, the institutions themselves, I found to be disturbingly, and I use this word in a, you know, in a advisedly, I know it's a, it's a provocative word, but kind of corrupt. And what I mean by corrupt is not that people were taking money on the side kind of thing, although that may happen, but it was really more that I didn't feel the relationships were genuine and legitimate and that people were doing things on the basis of ideas that they weren't really being honest about, they weren't really telling the truth about. So they're calling it justice, even though they're doing things that are very unjust. And they really probably kind of knew that. And that really disturbed me. And then, and, you know, and so what I felt was there were a lot of interests that were driving people's behavior that I, I didn't really either understand at first or agree with when I really 
became able to understand a little more. So one of the things that I have done throughout my career, I'm still a lawyer, is I have pursued other things, you know, not unlike you. I have tried other things. Weird. I mean, ranging from I went and played professional soccer, if you can believe that, in Asia, which was a childhood dream. And I never thought I'd get the chance, just happened to be able to do it. Writing, making movies, you know, different things that, and of course, our business aligners. So so I did go that path of being a lawyer. I'm still a lawyer, but I also, I just, I don't know. I just felt that there's more to life than maybe some of the ways that the legal system kind of operates in, in sort of strict or ways that I find not to be as just as they should. And that, that you know, that, that really affected me as I, as I thought about what's the life I want to live. That makes a lot of sense. I'm really sure that being a lawyer has been very handy with being able to prepare your contracts, be able to negotiate, obviously, your own deals, being able to create, you know, if you wanted to complete a patent, all of those things come in super handy. What was your area of specialty that you wanted to have? Yeah, so I, I really wanted to focus on bringing about justice for people who I felt, you know, were excluded from opportunity, who were treated in unjust ways. Like trafficking, human trafficking? Well, I didn't get involved in any human trafficking cases specifically. I did things around, I had to focus in certain areas of law that I, you know, that I had people come to me, talking to me about pretty frequently. So it involved things like housing discrimination, educational segregation and discrimination. So the, the schools through, you know, K-12 schools throughout the United States are shockingly segregated by right, race and income when you really look at the numbers. And that's, that's really, really increased over the last basically 20, 30 years. So looking at that, police misconduct cases. So uh, you're familiar with, obviously, the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. I, was, I represented people who were mistreated by uh, actually that police force. So I did that. And then I also was very involved in suing, representing people who were suing very large companies that were engaged in anti-competitive behavior where they were trying to exclude small companies, entrepreneurs. And again, you know, the idea was not that the, the best products or solutions are really the ones that are succeeding, but the companies that are doing the most uh, sort of exclusionary monopolistic kind of conduct. And you see that a lot, for example, in the IT sector, obviously, there's a lot of focus on that now. So yeah, so that was quite a few years ago, but those were the kinds of legal areas that I really focused on. I would think that's pretty rewarding, honestly. Uh, to do that, does that mean you were doing more pro bono work or were you? So it was, my life has always been a mixture of, fi and finding the right mixture of pro bono work that I really feel I want to do, and then making a living, supporting a family, you know, trying to make ends meet. And it's, uh, it's a juggle. And it's something that I've been an entrepreneur for, gee whiz, so, you know, more than 25 years and it's challenging. I left the big full law firm that I was with and then started a small firm with friends and family in Minneapolis and then ended up going on to, to do a liner as well. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting journey. It's, it's never easy. And this is one of the things I say, you know, you want to follow your heart for sure in your life and do the things that you feel are meaningful. And at the same time, you know, you are going to have responsibilities generally, especially in our modern society where things are expensive and it's, it's very hard to make, the, you know, to make ends meet if, you, if you're not getting some form of steady income. So, yeah, so I basically would do a lot of pro bono work and then also a lot of other work that I thought would, would help pay the bills. It's been a, it's been a balance. Uh -huh, uh -huh. With that background, I'm still kind of deviating, but I'm going to lead into the question that I know Axel's going to be coming up with is where did that transition from education, law, social justice, all turn into what you do now? How did that morph in there? Because did you find you had to have, did you go back to school and get education classes so you'd understand no. learning or what? It, no, I, you know, I, I, you know, I did a lot of reading, a lot of studying, working with people who are in the field. No, what happened is it was really, morphing is probably the right word. What happened is first I started out as a lawyer using the negotiation skills to help clients get good outcomes because most cases actually get resolved through negotiations. They don't actually go to a trial. And so one of, one of my large clients, essentially the corporate client in that case, said, we love this stuff you're doing on negotiation. 
would you bring it in as a, as a business process and teach us how to do it? And I thought, I don't even know how to do that. What do you mean? And so I actually consulted with friends and others who have built successful businesses around training and learning and development. And I started learning what it's all about. And this was more than 20 years ago. And then I dipped my toe in it and I loved it. And so what I started doing then is focusing both for pro bono and for the, you know, the corporations and others and governments and folks that could pay on how do we teach ourselves and each other skills that really make a difference in our lives and in our societies. And that really excited me. So things like active listening, compassion, even risk analysis, and knowing how and when to establish boundaries and limits with people. So a lot of it is about empowerment. A lot of it is about, you know, the skills of negotiation, influencing, persuasion. And the more I got into it, the more I really liked it because you're really interacting with people who feel there's a lot of meaning in what you're doing. So it was, it was, it was not something I planned by any means, but it just sort of started to happen. And the more I got into it and the more feedback we got about how much people liked it, I just went with it. And, and the other thing I'd say about that journey is it's always, as you said, about learning. And I feel I'm learning all the time. And so the feedback I get from people I'm working with, the feedback from you know, managers, learners, others, they like what they don't like. It's, it's amazing because I'm learning so much about how people see themselves, how they change, how they, how they interact with each other, and, and really what they feel brings them meaning and power in their lives. So it's super exciting work. It's always challenging, maybe not the same as trying jury case, case to a jury, which I've done a few times and it's, it's exciting, but maybe- Oh, that's stressful. Very stressful. That's the word that I would also use. Very stressful. So, you know, I, I, I like a challenge and getting, to be quite honest, getting adults in particular to be open to new ideas and reconsider how they interact with each other. That's a challenge. It's not easy. So, oh my God. Yeah. That saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? <laughs> Learners. They're really not talking about the dog because I can make that dog do what I'm wanting. They're motivated by food. People, much yeah. Much yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's true. And, it, and it's exciting, though, when you do reach them. Something that I have found, you know, we've kind of, in some ways, unlocked the mystery. And we did it in counterintuitive ways. One of the things you hear a lot about adult learners is you have to build on what they already know. You have to reassure them. You have to make them feel good about what you're doing. And I agree with all that. But I've also learned that when it comes to teaching people how interact differently around negotiation, collaboration, you know, choices about how to interact with people. They're already pretty baked in for most adults. They already have patterns. They have pretty good ideas in their mind, whether they're aware of it or not, about what they should do or shouldn't do. And so what I've actually found is a little shock therapy, if I say that kind of jokingly, but you saw a game that I've played with folks where you're interacting with a character who, you know what, she's just not going to cooperate sometimes. So then it's like, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to try to keep being the nice person? Are you going to just try, oh, yes, I want to work with you. I want to collaborate. Well, she may just kind of like mess around and be incredibly impossible. Well, hello, that's real life too, right? We all encounter people who drive us nuts. They won't do what we want them to do. They won't collaborate. If we try to collaborate, they take advantage of us. You know, putting adults in this situation where they can't control the other side and where the other person may or may not go along with them, I have found it's really amazing because it, what it does is it, first of all, people get annoyed with, when they interact with, with that character, they get annoyed. But then they try to figure out, okay, I can do this. I can get this person, this computer character to behave and, and come around. And maybe they can and maybe they can't. And it's that moment that we start talking about, like, why is it that things work or don't work the way you want them to? We begin to realize, yeah, you know what? I can't really control other people, but I can control what I do. So maybe I, first of all, better be a little bit more aware of what I do and think about how it impacts other people. Just to get to that point with adults, it's like, wow. I mean, you just get so excited. It's like- Oh my God, yeah. I, I said this to you at the conference, or maybe it was, I don't know, when we were talking about you coming on the show. I work at Sunday school teacher, three-year-olds. I think everybody is a three-year-old and I equate a lot of what you're saying 
to getting that three-year-old to do what I am asking them to do because it's a choice. They can, they can't, they'll throw themselves on the floor. Adults are the same. Yeah. I sit here and I say, it is all I can do to keep this girl in check. And she's <laughs> like a hot mess also. So to say that us. I can control myself, maybe. Yes, I can. And it's a choice, right? That's the thing. And, and you know, and it is. And it, it's really interesting because what we do so often is we blame the other person. I mean, especially, I mean, let's be honest. It's somebody, especially if it's like family or somebody around us a lot, we don't like the patterns. We want them to do something. We want them to stop doing something. What actually happens is the more we push or the more they're aware that we're trying to like influence them or affect them somehow to do something or stop doing something, what do they do? It's like immediately, oh, I, you know, they, it gives them power and they love that power. I mean, we all love some form of power. I mean, at some point in our lives, it's exciting. It's exhilarating dishonorable in many ways, former United States Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said, its power is this great aphrodisiac. People get excited about it. And unfortunately, it makes us do a lot of really foolish things and make bad decisions. And then, of course, blame everything around us for, for that. So a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the interactions with adult learners, as with kids as well, is, you know, are we getting a little too excited about power? Or are we too intimidated by power because nobody has power forever? And so, you know, thinking about how can we empower ourselves appropriately and to your point, control ourselves and our emotions and behave in ways that are actually healthy for us and the people around us, the relationships we have. I mean, that sort of, you know, that sort of way of thinking gets really super exciting when people explore it and, and, and start trying it. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's fun. I'm going to call Axel. What do you think of all that? I think he's frozen. No, I'm still here. <laughs> I was paying attention. Yeah. yeah, I don't think that screensaver is going to work so well for you, buddy. Oh, in the back? Yeah, but it makes your teeth get a big black gap in the middle. I think that's all of them, though. <laughs> um, okay, so what are your thoughts on what we were talking about? He is right about, you know, us being, some, some of us are afraid of somebody trying to take over our own rights when it comes to power, or we we are the ones trying to control everything. In reality, you can't really do that because there's always gonna be something that pops up that will like something will go wrong eventually. Something will go wrong and then you will have to try to fix it and then you'll be super stressed out and it'll just go wrong. And it's it's happened with companies that were up on the top and they have been burnt down actually you're wise beyond your years buddy <laughs> thanks very true no very true what you're saying nobody's on top forever and even yeah. when, and i've dealt with a lot of very powerful people all right full disclosure let me just put it out there my wife also i met she and i met at harvard law school she's actually a former classmate and close friend of barack obama and i i was also i was a year ahead of them but i used to play basketball with barack and i you know knew him quite well law school so a long time ago and I've been able to work with and deal with a lot of people who have a lot of power, at least appear to have a lot of power. They're in, you know, they may be running big companies or governments, that kind of thing. And here's what I found about them pretty much to a person. And I say this, you know, understanding that it may sound a little crazy. Most of them feel powerless. That's subjectively how they feel. And they also uh, have generally a lot of fear. They're worried about losing the power that they have. The reason they feel powerless, most of them, is because they are so reliant on other people agreeing with and implementing what they want them to do. And it's super, you, you basically can't control the other people. They're going to, they may say yes to your face, right? They may say, oh, yeah, 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 yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But they're going to go out and do whatever they think is in their own interest. And so even when you seem to have a lot of power or, or, or people from the outside think you must have a lot of power, it's pretty interesting how the actual dynamics work within large organizations. You know, power is, in my experience, highly overrated. Much more powerful, ironically, are skills like active listening, problem solving, creative problem solving in particular, and being good at risk analysis, as well as being able to communicate these things. So if somebody's going to mess with me, you know, I need to think it through, right? Can I afford to, to have conflict with this person? If so, you know, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like for me? What's it going to look like for them? How's it going to come out? 
How ruthless am I willing to be? How ruthless could they be? And I need to do that all in my mind before anything happens, because the last thing you want to do is you're suddenly in a boxing ring with, you know, Muhammad Ali. Oh, <laughs> oh, you're in trouble. So it's, it's really, it's really about thinking through things that, you know, most of us just react with emotion and get ourselves all worked up and angry or into these bad situations. We don't even know how we got into it and much less how to get out of it. So a lot of what I've learned and helped other folks work through over the years, and, and we really teach with our games and, and classes is, you know, how can you model it out in a really disciplined, rigorous way so that you have confidence about your own risk analysis and so you can make good decisions and so you can actually communicate that information if and when appropriate to the other side. So maybe they realize, don't mess with me, not a good idea, it's not gonna go well for you. And, and that may sound like a rough thing to say, but sometimes you need to be able to put up those boundaries or put out those warnings. I mean, you know, it's, it's as simple as, you know, you really wanna go mess with a little furry animal walking on the side of the road that has black fur and a white stripe in the middle. It's like the white stripe's there to warn you, it's telling you, you, it's going to smell, you're going to smell real bad, real fast if you, if you mess with that animal. And, and I use the example because too many of us, you know, forget about the white stripe. You know, we got to go out there and say sometimes, you know what, I don't want to have conflict with you. I really don't. But if we're going to have a problem, it's not only, I'm not the only one who's going to have this problem. To think that way and, and communicate it appropriately so that you don't just upset people it's, it's, a, it's an incredible skill. Yeah, it's so, it's so important to be able to think these things through, and it's not easy. I agree. I agree. Okay, Axel, what's our next question? We spoke a lot, but we did not get a chance to talk about why you named a liner. You the company. Yeah, a liner. Yeah, well, you know, for anybody thinking about starting a company or setting up stuff, you, one of the things, first thing you got to do is look at what web domains are available, and you got to be creative, right? Because there's not so many available, at least it seems that way. So the reason we named it Aligner is basically we wanted to think about aligning people and A-L-I-G-N-E-R Aligner.com was already taken. I'm like, all right, well, what about A-L-I-G-N-O-R? And then somebody's like, well, what you're really saying is align or else. And I'm like, no. That's pretty much what it sounds like. Yeah. So we basically picked a, a name that we felt was about helping people gain alignment in organizations and with the uh, relationships that matter to them. So that was kind of where it came from. Yeah, I think that was a good choice because I actually, when I had seen it, I thought it's a line or, or like, or else, just yeah. like you were saying. I think <laughs> it's very appropriate. Favorite book and why? You know, I have so many, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to one that, okay, well, from childhood, my very favorite book was Watership Down by Richard Adams. If anybody hasn't read it, if there's one book you read in your life, read Watership Down. It's a wonderful story, but it's an amazing allegory as well about people. It's incredible. You'll love it. Watership Down. So that was, you know, my, my favorite book growing up. Okay, so I'm going to do something really crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one more book. This is, an, a, this is a book for deep thinkers. And I say that because it's a hard book. It's not actually written by the person whose words you're gonna encounter. It's actually a compilation of talks that were given by a philosopher from the 21st, or rather the 20th century, an Indian philosopher named J. Krishnamurti. And Krishnamurti had amazingly challenging and perceptive ideas and insights. And the book that, that I would recommend, which is a compilation of his talks and answers to questions, is called Think on These Things. And I will tell you, if you like interesting ideas, wow, he's got amazing ideas. Really interesting. Very challenging, but very interesting. So there, there's I'm pulling a it up right now just to see it. And I, I was going to do the same. I was going to like, man, I can't <laughs> yeah, it says an inquiry based program for high school and college students with the goal of creating a space for authentic exploration of fundamental questions. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, very accurate. Hmm, that sounds good. Watership Down, isn't that a kid's book with a rabbit? Yes, it's about rabbits, but it's really about people, but it's great. Yeah, it's- it's Kind of like the other one where it was the animals, animal, what was it? Animal it? Farm, yeah, but this, one, this one's a, you know, more of a story. Yeah, where you really, yeah, I mean, our Animal Farm's wonderful too. 
Mm -hmm. My favorite book, I don't know if Axel has one, but my favorite book, a kid's book is The Giving Tree. I just love that one. But if I pick something that is more of an adult book, this is a very powerful book. It's The Things They Carried. And it was, do you know that book? I haven't heard of it. So The Things They Carried is a series of vignettes written by people that had been in war. They talked about the physical weight of each piece of equipment that the military, more in the army, wore. But they also talked about the, the weight of the emotions and loss, everything that was so damaging about war. So it's, it is a very powerful book and you can actually get it. I think they allow it to even be downloaded now. It was cool. one of the best books I have ever read. Wow. Uh, on the Giving Tree. Sounds powerful. Yeah, it is. I would recommend those two books for sure. What about you, Axel? Favorite book? I do screenwriting. So my favorite book is called Saved by the Cat. And that talks about like pretty much like how you like do storytelling uh, and how like there's like 12 steps to it for my screenwriting. And it was really good because that one was for the screenwriting. And I learned a lot on as well on how to do, how, how to finish first phase, which is like the first 30 pages which is more of like the conflict and the fun and activities of what you pretty much watch in a movie trailer. And then you have the um, ending phase, which is like 60 pages to 90, which is pretty much like you battling uh, the young hero, battling the young villain and all this commotion and trying to save the girl or uh, trying to save the family now, whatever the case might be. But I really enjoy it. it and another book that I have, I haven't finished reading it, but it's called, I'll say The Great Gatsby. The Great Gatsby, I think is really good. The classic. It is um, a classic. And I like the movie too. Uh, the movie that they did, I think is very accurate towards the book. The recent, not, the recent one? Yeah. DiCaprio? Yeah, DiCaprio and Maguire. That's good. Um, I just think it's very like, cause like if you like really read it and then watch the movie, there's a lot of similarities to it. And not that many books have that. Cool. That's just my opinion. There's a lot of books. That. Let, let me change that. The book is the original. The movie is the ripoff. So no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm just that is how, not like, always not. Yeah, because like usually when when you read a book and you picture, you know, certain things. You get movies, to have whatever you want in your head, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, why don't you ask him the question that you have about the novel or the script or whatever it is? Oh, okay. So, into our future of. So this is going to be your last question. A question I have, which was like, you know, writing and stuff like that. So for you, which one is harder since you have written novels? Would it be like writing an actual novel or writing a script? Since I saw on one of your profiles that you you've made movies. Yeah, I made a couple of them, actually. Yeah. yeah. So they're totally different. But what they have in common is you have to tell a really compelling story for an audience that you can at least imagine. The difference is the process itself is very, very different post-writing. In a movie, it's all about collaboration. And because of that, you have to write when you're writing a script for that collaboration. So when I write a novel, I'm going very deeply into characters I've created in my mind and their reality. And it, I have an idea of where it's going to go, but I'm always surprised and, you know, at, at times delighted about how the characters turn or twist what I thought was going to happen into something a little bit different. That for me is the fun, the beauty of that experience, that creative experience. When you're writing a script, a, a screenplay for a movie, the thing is, and not unlike what you were describing, Axel, about thinking about it in three parts, all of these structural conventions are, they're not, it's not that you have to abide by them strictly, you have to be aware of them because ultimately, if you write a script that you, you know, there's no point in writing it unless you're writing it just to sell it as a script, you're really writing it to see it be made into a movie. And yeah. if you be made into a movie, you have to be very aware of that collaborative nature and the conventions around the movie making the you know pr principal photography the filmmaking the editing all these different things 
And so you're really thinking it takes you in some regards out of the story in weird ways so that you have more sort of conscious thinking about how to present or depict using visual elements, using, you know, you could even be thinking about the music you want to go with it. I mean, there's so many different things you're thinking about that are not just like what the character's experiencing. And for me, the fun of writing a novel is that adventure, that exploration with the character about that reality that you've created. So they're, they're very different. I like both, but they're really different. That's all good stuff there. So we're going to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsor. So we'll be right back. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Okay, so we're back to our show, and it's all about internships and the future of work. I had told you a little bit, John, about what Intern Pursuit is. It's there to help you know build a an opportunity to skill the, obviously the intern, but also upskill the employee built around peer and reverse mentoring. What do you think future of work is going to look like? So Axel pulled some research on it and we'll have some fun, fast responses, but right now, what do you think it's going to look like in 2030? Oh, you know, I think, I think there are really three factors that are going to be absolutely crucial One is the relationships you have. So having the right relationships is absolutely critical. Very few people, even in this world of, you know, AI and online uh, applications, very few people get their dream job, something other than relationships. It's usually, you know, somebody, something happens and it may be something you plan. It may be something that's serendipity. It just happens to you. So number one is relationships. Number two, I believe, is the skills that you develop, your ability to do a variety of different things. Because the tools are evolving so fast that we work with, your ability to adapt to those and have really powerful soft skills around influencing, dealing with people, listening, problem solving, risk analysis, these kinds of skills are absolutely crucial. And every organization that I've seen and work with, they're all looking for people with those skills. And then the third thing I think is having the formal sort of education or certifications, whatever it is you need for the field you want to go into. So I think that's going to continue to be both a help and a hindrance. It's a hindrance in that it offers kind of a barrier for people already in it to keep out others who haven't gotten into it yet. But also when you can achieve it, when you can go through the path and get a certain certification or a degree or something like that, it does also kind of, in a, in a sense, let you into that club. So I think the three factors I would focus on are relationships, your skills, and then the sort of the formal educational background certification, those kind of things that you may need. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that colleges are going to be honestly going away. I think that it will be more in the sense of what do you need to be an attorney, a doctor. I think even an educator falls in there because I think people will still want to have teachers, professors that have higher level degrees. I think that will be very, very valuable. Certifications will become more online. I can definitely, we already see that happening now. So the other thing about it is for those that do go to school, it will be more of a privilege to be able to go to school and be immersed in that type of an experience. Going to school has always been, I think, a rite of passage of where you learn about yourself and you begin to know how to socialize and work with people and go, oh, it's not like high school, right? I don't belong to this club. I need to, and I'm not a big deal. I'm just a little tiny fish in there. I think that's definitely something that we're going to see happening. But I think that those, I call them power skills. I was reading how that term soft skills is being seen as a way to, it's diminishing how we differentiate humans from AI and technology. And if we were to focus on the word power as a power skill, it's really, they've said, differentiating it and realizing that is the strength of a human. The ability, I think, to have high attention to detail is going to be even more important than ever because, as you mentioned, trends, technology, every time I get up in the morning, I go, okay, which one of the social channels changed? What has changed on Google? Where is this going? What is the cybersecurity news that I need to know? 
So being very obviously self-aware, high attention to detail, to catch nuances and things that are just smack dab and hitting you in the face. So I feel like that's going to be how we begin to see, see differences. You mentioned something way back, we were talking about your path in law. So I want to take a little sidestep back there. The giants of Google and Amazon and Facebook, is that kind of a monopoly <laughs> to me? Like, oh, absolutely. They are- uh, How they even be around? Well, the, the, the issue is that the law originally as intended was as much, this is the antitrust laws, the anti-monopoly laws. So these laws were actually intended, interestingly, as much as social laws as economic. And what I'm talking about is when you have too few people, as they did over 100 years ago when the, when the antitrust laws were passed in the United States, with too much power and money, it's not good for the society. It's not good for most of the people. It's not good for the society. It's certainly not good for democracy. And so the, the laws were passed really as a check on excessive power by too few individuals. You know, they called them the robber barons back then. And what we see is we're back at the same place. Again, over 100 years later, we're back with too few people with way too much power, way too much money. And the reason, to some extent, it's been allowed to happen is the antitrust laws, in my opinion, have not been enforced or interpreted by the federal courts in the United States as they really were intended to be, which is to protect competitors and competition as much as to keep prices low. So the idea is, you know, kind of the way it's looked at now is that, well, as long as Google gives it to you for free, what are you complaining about? As they say in, you know, in Silicon Valley, and I'm sure most, most folks watching or listening to the podcast have heard this, if you don't know who the, who the, what the product is, you are the product, meaning they're monetizing you and your time, and they're manipulating you to do that. And so, yeah, that's too much power. And you can only do it when you have kind of monopoly type power. So this needs to be dealt with. It needs to be addressed. I know Congress is looking at this right now in the United States right now. But I actually think that the laws, if they were properly you know, understood and enforced as intended, would actually bring a lot of protection. So I'm very hopeful something happens soon. I think it has to, or we're going to end up in a very difficult place because you know, if you have too few people and companies with too much power, it's, it's not healthy for individuals and very unhealthy for the no, system. No, because... I, this is nowhere near like what we were talking about, you know, the future of learning. However, it does impact, you know, directly. Oh, it's, it's absolutely part of the future of learning. If you they, look, if you, if you have a great idea and you can't get it into the Apple store or you can't get it, you know, where people need to be able to access it because it's too threatening to big companies, what do they do historically? They, they either suppress you or buy you out. And that's, that is very true. That is right? that's not good for it's not good for competition. It's certainly not good for competitors, and it's not good for the society. And it's absolutely relevant to learning. Absolutely. Yeah, because I can see this as a to me, it is a giant monopoly. And what will take the country down? It's not going to be missiles. They don't ever have to shoot another missile again. It's going to be you take out either the financial ecostructure of a country, you take out the ability to communicate. Or you bring in some type of a disease. And I am saying, like, is that not what's going on? Okay, so we have 10 trends that we're supposed to be aware of. Adaptive learning, which is pretty much like, you know, customized learning plans. Yes or no? What do you think? Oh, we're all over it. And we build adaptive learning into our learning. So yeah, 100%. It should be individualized and it should respond to what people do. Love it. Yep. Okay, social learning, where we're actually looking at how we interact and group dynamics. And even, you know, it impacts our social channels? Yeah, no, 100%. That's actually our business in Aligner. We use games and ways to do role plays that are non-threatening and then have conversations with the group about, well, what did you learn? What did you see? And we look at data together to see mm -hmm. how did, what does it tell us? I love it. Social learning is an absolute must. Yeah, it's it's almost like influencer, right? It's how yeah, micro-influencers in our groups. Well, yeah. and when we talk about relationships, that's social. You have to, you have, to have those skills, 100%. Video learning. I don't think we'll ever get away from it. I don't know. Yeah, you know, if we're talking, if we're talking online virtual learning, I agree, it's here to stay, and it's going to be. It, it has a place, but it's got to be done really well, and that's something we've really focused on: is getting rid of all the boring stuff 
So just watching long videos, I, I somebody recently told me, you know, if I see it's a 45 minute video, I already know I'm not interested. Five minute micro video, micro learning where you hit it and it's like pretty cool. But I think we gotta be super careful about over overwhelming people with just like blah, blah, blah videos. Yeah, I agree, I agree. And even in Star Wars movies, I mean, they still had little videos, communicators. Okay, artificial intelligence, all right. That is everything across the board. How, what do you think? Yeah, that, the problem is people don't really understand what it is. And it, it can either sound scary or sound great. It's often overblown what it's doing right now. We do use some AI, but it's very simple. It's really just helping. What it's doing is if you were to watch and learn and improve yourself and you could really keep watching, that's kind of what AI is. It's just doing it faster and better than people. Where I get really worried is... First of all, when we're talking big scale AI and deep data and, you know, tracking people and private, that's really bad news. Number one. Number two, I have a question. Who are the people who should decide what AI is? Because to be honest, it's a very small subset of the human species that's doing it. And they're, I mean, pretty close to the last people I would pick to be doing it. They're not representative. Gender diversity, ethnic diversity, diversity of thinking, diversity of experience, it's not there. And that's a huge problem. And I'll tell you why it is. What they're doing right now is they're baking in the existing biases and problems that we have in society into computers and calling it AI so that we just keep replicating the same mistakes over and over again. Really bad idea. So that's that's my take on AI. Mm. Micro learning. I know we just talked. I love micro learning. Oh, my goodness. So micro learning, just so everybody understands what it is. We're talking like five to 10 minutes and you can get something real and powerful and valuable out of it. So I love it. We're getting so much feedback from learners that they love it too. So we're actually, a big focus that we have at Aligner is micro learning, micro learning, micro learning. And we put them into learning journeys that include conversations and chats and stuff where we talk about the ideas. But yeah, micro learning is a really powerful idea if it's done well, for sure. I agree. And I think that the reason why we have micro learning, I don't think I absolutely, I'm going to say I know is because everything is on our phone and that's a constant device that's always taking our attention away from anything. So we have no attention span. So it has to be short. Well, back to what Axel and I were talking about in movies, for example, in the old days, if you watch a movie from the fifties, they'll show a long, long stretch with no cuts. You go to the 60s and 70s, it's still, you know, pretty much. Now, I, I was reading the statistics, I don't know, a couple of years ago. It's like every, I don't know, 1.5 seconds, there's a cut, 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 cut. Every time that happens, it's interrupting your brain's focus on what's going on. So, yeah, we're, we've been trained now, sadly, to not be able to concentrate and focus. And so, yeah, we, we we're requiring things in smaller and smaller bites to really follow. Yeah, that, that grid's going to go down and people better know how to write and they better know how to read because there will be <laughs> there will be no phones, there will be no computers, and it will be oh, what is it that Arnold Schwar Schwarzenegger was in the movies? Puerto Rico. It is so Terminator. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> everything's going to go. I hope not, but I'm excited to get over. <laughs> uh, yes, there are many dystopian visions that one hopes do not come to pass, but. I don't hope that one does, but to me, it's just like, it's going to be long and hard when it happens to everybody around the world. And I think that COVID was just a little glimpse as to what can happen. Very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Gamification. Well, your product is a game. That's what we do, man. You know, it's funny. Everybody loves a game. I'm a former, you know, I played soccer at a very high level and, and, and love sports and games. What we do with the games, the reason we do it in games is we put people in scenarios that they can relate to, and then they have to make choices and the characters they're dealing with react in very different ways, depending on their choices. And the idea is that, you know, you can make choices that are passive where you really don't want to deal with stuff or you're not going far enough. You can make choices that are aggressive, that are going to push the other side and maybe get an intense reaction where we want people to be as appropriately assertive so that they're actually thinking about what needs to be done to move this to, to a, a good outcome. And we found that the game format is something people love. So I'm, I'm all for gamification. It is. I will warn everybody who's just thinking, oh, yeah, just games, games, games. I'm not talking like violent, crazy video games or inappropriate games. I'm talking about games that really make you think. And for me, that's kind of the fun of it, right? Because when you do have to think and you do have to reflect on why things happen, it really allows you, in a sense, to put a mirror up to yourself. It's kind of a role play. And it's, you know, it's safe. It's just a game. 
but it gives you a really good opportunity to reflect on things that are important. So yeah, I, I love games. I think, I think they, they work very well for learning. Perfect. Mobile learning? Yeah, I mean, as you said, it's here to stay. Yeah, we're, this is the way we, li we live and we work, and I think we're going we're gonna to have it for a while at least. Mm -hmm. Augmented or and or virtual reality. So I am a big believer in reality, reality. I <laughs> ships people and I wish we were all in the same room and could go out to dinner after this, but we're doing it through technology. So I'm, I'm, I am not a technophobe. I appreciate what technology can do for us. I think we want to make intelligent decisions about how far we go with reality in particular. You know, a screen is already interposed between our you know, understanding of reality and what it is. Our brains do the same thing with us, actually. They, they give us images of reality that are, you know, that are unique to each of us. So I'm, you know, I'm curious. It looks like fun. And I, I love the, the creativity of augmented reality. But I think we do want to be very careful about getting ourselves too easily addicted to things that are unfortunately not real or are real in ways that cause other problems to, to a, you know, the very real world. So yeah, I'm a little cautious about augmented reality. Mm. Learning management systems. They're not tremendously innovative or adding a lot of value. When you compare, when you look at all the, essentially the amazing technology systems that are out there, we need to work with them and Aligner does. We, we integrate with the LMSs, no problem. And, you know, but I don't see the LMS in and of itself as bringing massive value other than to administrators who need to manage learning for their organizations. Okay. And then we are right there at our last one, learning and development. I mean, that's here to stay. That's how, that's super, super important, but it is all of those methods combined and then stuff that we haven't even thought of. Right on. You know, again, why I went on my own personal career journey to where I am now is I believe in people and I believe in learning and I believe that we all need to continue learning and developing as we go in anything we do, whether it's a job, whether it's relationships, whether it's pursuits, hobbies, things we love. At Aligner, we have become very good at measuring various things that correlate highly to results that, you know, business results that organizations want. But I still think there's a beauty and a, a real need and a, a for the appreciation of learning and development for what it does for people and what it does for the morale of, you know, the people in an organization. So I, I very, very much hope that we continue to see it given the importance that it really needs. Mm. Best mentoring advice that you would like to pass on to our listeners? So this is from Kwame Gray when I was in college, actually. So he was a civil rights icon. He, if you look him up as, if for those not familiar with him, I know I'm, my age is showing a little on this, but he was known as Stokely Carmichael in the 1960s, was to some extent credited with black power. So I was at a talk he gave and what he said to me, I went and talked to him afterward. He was kind enough to sign a book and, and share a few words. What he said was, keep smiling always because what's going to happen, what he really meant was you're going to come across all kinds of challenges, doubters, difficulties, especially when you're younger and as you continue in life and it can, it can bring us down. And so what he really said was, no matter what it is, pursue the things that are important to you. What he, what he meant was, keep that passion, keep that love of, you know, whatever you're doing, don't ever let it get away and don't let any, don't let others take it from you. And I think that's the best mentoring I've ever heard from anyone. All right. So how can our listeners contact you? I'm, I'm available through LinkedIn, but please visit our website. We have games available that you can play for free and try. I think you'll enjoy them. Our website is www.aligner, A-L-I-G-N-O-R.com, aligner.com, and, and reach out to, to me. I'd love to hear from you as together we, you know, we're so much more powerful. Ah, there we go. There's our website. All right. Well, John, I want to tell you, thank you so much for being our guest today. This was delightful. I'd love to have you back again. I would continue these conversations for sure. Say thank you to Cat5 Studios. Thank you to our production team, Axel Laponte and Elizabeth Herbert, associate producer interns, video and audio editing, Steve Neese, our video interns, Raymond, Berkeley, and Mitsari. And employers, we want to ask and invite you to visit Intern Pursuit at www.internpursuit.tech to learn how you can get matched to amazing intern talent and be an employer for change.